Certainly at this point, I mean, for a lot of archives, they likely have more analog audiovisual collections than there is remaining lifespan in the hardware that they have that can play them back. All this kind of produces a, um, like a challenge for archivists because there is an extreme urgency to digitize material, but also archivists traditionally have a very high degree of uncertainty on how to do so and what decisions to make when they are selecting uh, file formats, uh, codecs, and specifications. So um, this is a bit less true with uh, image archiving and audio archiving, where there's uh, more consensus on formats like TIFF and broadcast wave. Uh, with audiovisual archiving, uh, you'll find a variety of different solutions that are all kind of happening simultaneously, from using uncompressed in AVI, or JPEG 2000 in XF, or ProRes in QuickTime, or F51 in Matroska. <coughs> This is uh, you know, still a, an evaluation and a dialogue that, that is quite active in, in audiovisual archiving. And the, the pace at which this conversation is happening is not necessarily uh, reactive to the urgency in which the results have to occur. For, for audiovisual archivists, um, like audiovisual archiving tends to be a community that adopts tools from other fields uh, rather than has their own, so a lot of the tools you see in uh, production facilities, um, you know, use of like Final Cut Pro and editing software, production software, gets kind of like repurposed in archival workflows to support audiovisual digitization and, and preservation work. Uh, historically, audiovisual archivists have a pretty uh, comprehensive relationship with the fields of um, broadcast video engineering, and increasingly more so, they have relationships with, uh, with computer uh, video. Um, you know, the communities that kind of support like the, the open work that we see in computer video in, in environments like LibAV and FFmpeg isn't necessarily the same kind of environments that we see in like, uh, you know, Simpy and, uh, in, you know, broadcast communities. Uh, both of these communities have, you know, quite, you know, unique solutions to the same problems and sometimes, and I think they're both worthy of looking at. Uh, this conference kind of focuses more on like the, the open source approach of like what has been developing in in uh, computer video environments and applying that uh, for consideration and preservation. So, um, so two of the two of the projects that that this uh, symphonism is kind of based on include the Performa project and the Media Commons project. Uh, Performa is a European Union uh, a European Commission funded project uh, to, to look at the challenge of um, uh, how audiovisual archivists can control digital file formats. Uh, for audiovisual archivists, we tend to have decades of experience in preserving analog video or film. Uh, like there is vast amounts of expertise in the preservation and conservation of film materials and analog materials. Uh, but for working with uh, digital video materials, our community is still kind of new and certainly doesn't have the same level of control that uh, with digital formats as we do with analog formats. So uh, the preservation, I mean, the performer project is a bit of a reaction to this gap to help, um, you know, fund the development of tools and research and community to support um, uh, better, you know, better control of digital file formats in preservation context. And, uh, Proforma looks uh, determines some specific file formats to look look at, uh, including TIFF and PDF. Um, for audiovisual formats, they d decided to work with FFV1 and Matroska, and uh, Media Area, which uh, is kind of the, the company that developed the open source project at Uh is addressing the audiovisual aspect of this project. Uh, their tool called Media Conch. Uh, so me and actually and Jerome. Uh, you know, collaborate on that project. <coughs> uh, and then, you know, one of the, the themes of the Performer project is, is the uh, relationship between the development communities and the archiving communities. Like, so often in our archiving work, like, we'll assess file formats or, um, you know, try to develop workarounds, but often, like, there's not enough direct communication between uh, the people who uh, develop and maintain file formats and the archivists that kind of depend on understanding them and uh, controlling them in long-term environments. So I'm, you know, grateful, like looking at the registration uh, for this conference, that it is, you know, a nice balance of like, you know, developers and archivists. Um, I can say at this at this symposium, like, you know, we really hope that this symposium is as participatory as, as possible. Uh, and that this is more so a priority than it being an overly uh, technical conference. So if you, uh, 
you know, feel very welcome to ask uh, clarifying questions or engage in dialogue with, with people, um, you know, to, to, uh, to cover the subjects that we're talking about today. Um, over the past few years, we've seen more uh, people working in preservation and archiving, participating in open source video environments in, in communities, such as on Metrospa Devel and FFmpeg uh, and LibAV's development listservs. Uh, and you know this kind of uh, communication and collaboration has, has led to uh, some of the features of development that we see in FFv1 and Matroska as far as incorporating more uh, features that are supportive of uh, long-term preservation into those file formats. Um, for example, in FFv1 version 3, um, the, the revision of it uh, has a feature to support embedded checksums into the, the frame of each file. Um, you know, which, which is kind of a reaction to some of the discrepancies of applying digital preservation strategy to audiovisual collections. Uh, if, you, if, you look at, if you look at an average uh, archive that's not an audiovisual archive, if they have, you know, say 100 gigabytes of storage, that might represent uh, tens of thousands of files from images and documents and electronic records. But for an audiovisual archivist, the same amount of space might just have like a dozen files. Like the data we work with is of so much larger file size that many of the strategies for digital preservation don't scale fairly. So, um, for instance, if like if one archivist has you know tens of thousands of checksums protecting 100 gigabytes, whereas an audiovisual archivist has you know 10 or 12, uh, you know it it limits the amount of ability that that we have to respond to. Um, any types of digital corruption or modification to the file. Uh, the, like the, the new feature in FFV1 to incorporate fixity into the stream, it means that the file, if it has any damage or corruption at all, it can be reported and uh, isolated to a particular frame so that it can be recovered. Whereas if we just had one checksum for the entire file, we'd be a bit lost on where the problem is, because it would be somewhere in this vast amount of like, you know, hundreds of, of gigabytes. Um, this event has a uh, like a related event happening also in Berlin at the IETF, which is the Internet Engineering Task Force. Um, a, a number of us who are here today uh, participated in a, a proposal to the Internet Engineering Task Force to support a uh, working group, uh, which is now called Seller. Um, Tessa Fallon, one of the co-chairs, will do a presentation on the IETF's work a bit later today. Uh, the IETF is an open standards organization, um, so you know they, you know they work uh, c collaboratively on uh, standards projects, and uh, you know do not, um, you know do you know store them openly uh, and accessibly, like without the use of paywalls or like licensing restrictions on what somebody can do with the standards. The um, the IETF uh, seller working group is tasked with um, refining the standardization and specification documents of Matroska FFV1 and FLAC. All three of these formats have uh, specifications that were made by the format creators and developers that are on their own projects' websites. Um, but Seller is, is intended to refine these works in the context of a standards organization. Um, I'd say like working with, uh, like for instance, some of the Matroska developers earlier in the project, um, you know, like the, there would be uh, like, you know, um, a feeling that like the, the state of the specification was was stable because it had not a lot of changes recently, um, and like when we start to look at the specification in much more detail in the context of the standards organization, like it really shows how much more work it, is needed as we pick out all these kind of consistencies and inferences throughout the specification and figure out what needs to, to be clarified. Um, so the IETF seller working group has been. Uh, you know, very active to kind of refine these uh, documents. Um, last week, uh, through our collaborative work, we submitted about 300 pages of documentation to the ITF for the consideration of our first first drafts of this. Um, and we've been getting back like an, a lot more feedback than we can really deal with at this point. But like once we get back home, uh, we can start to resolve a lot of the issues that we're getting out of the conference. Um, so the IETF Seller Working Group is happening tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so uh, there'll be like a split in the event where um, some of us leave to go to the IETF conference and then the rest of the symposium stays at the Zeus Institute and sees the streaming of that event. Um, but we're kind of intended to have like this overlapping point between uh, the two conferences. Yeah, and that covers my note. That's like the, the introduction of this, but uh, I'm really excited 
to see some of the presentations we have today. I know we have like the founder of Matroska speaking and uh, presentations about the history of FFV1. Uh, like we'll have a mix of presentations about the final formats themselves, um, as well as the standards process and uh, presentations about the implementation of these file formats and preservation context. Um, you know, I hope that you feel welcome to participate and ask questions and enjoy the conference. And I get back to Ashley for some other announcements. More logistics, yeah. I've already mentioned I'm also a trained as a film archivist, working with film as early as 1917. Ooh. <laughs> um, but I also work as a developer. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the unconference structure that we have tomorrow. I think sometimes this isn't necessarily familiar or comfortable with a lot of people because uh, today we mostly have structured talks and then you were listening and asking questions and engaging uh, in that way uh, with the people presenting. And then tomorrow when we're at the Zeus Institute, it'll be a little more abstract and more uh, open to uh, group work and uh, collaborating together within different areas and areas based sort of on what you feel is important and what you want to talk about. So we have and we posted a planning document if you want to take a look at that and maybe pitch ideas or just start thinking today. I think today is a really good day to start thinking about maybe what we can work on doing tomorrow, either in discussion or collaborating or even developing, if that's interesting to people. Um, we can organize uh, unconferences around aspects of Smokowska and FFA1, our um, preservation of AV assets, or really whatever you want. Um, I was thinking that even if you are tired of listening to people speak in English, you could have an unconference group based around your preferred native language. Um, I know that trying to listen to another language all day can be kind of exhausting. Um, uh, so that's really all I had to say about unconference styles. I don't know if there's any questions now about uh, how this will play out. That seems good. Okay. okay. Oh yeah? Question? Uh, well, we have a, like a planning document to define like what the groups are and the working. Oh, I just mentioned the planning document. It's posted um, online and we sent it out in an email and I think that we'll send it out again later tonight. But the person who asked the question, I think is doing that. <laughs> um, and that's really all I have. Oh, we have Erwin speaking. Um, he's coming from the Netherlands. And I can't pronounce his last name. I wasn't prepared to introduce you. But you, he needs no introduction. He is Erwin. <laughs> I can't pronounce my name. 